Good afternoon. Um, we had like some technical difficulties. My blood pressure is still super high, but I think I'll get into this and calm down. It's all working now. Um, the tech guys are awesome if you guys need help. <laughs> so, um, my name is Laura Drummer. I'm doing a talk today on sentiment and social network analysis. Um, the name changes a lot. I've changed it to, for intelligence and law enforcement. That's how I've used this um, technique, but it can be applied to commercial things as well. Um, just a little bit about me. I work for a company called Novetta. Uh, we are primarily in government consulting. We have a few software uh, offerings um, in the realm of entity analytics, cyber analytics, and um, something we call media analytics, which is a lot of like Twitter and news um, parsing. Um, my background is, I put this up here because it kind of informs what this tool or this prototype is that I've built. Um, I have a background in Chinese language. I was a cyber analyst for a few years. Um, I went to work for Novetta, and now I am what some people call a data scientist. So that's me. Um, I feel like this is in a weird spot. So one more thing about me. Um, I am 36 weeks pregnant, and so I put this up here just so we can all settle down for a second. Um, there's like a .06 chance that I'm going to go into labor today, so <laughs> this is mostly for my husband, this slide, but like, I think I'll be fine. I'll let you know if there's an issue. And then this one's for me. It, it's showing me that eventually like, I will be 100% pregnant and be able to touch my toes again and stuff like that, so, um, so now it's not, that's like out of the way. I want to talk to you guys about uh, this prototype. So, so I'm going to go into what we're trying to solve. I'm going to do a little bit of intro of social network analysis, um, some natural language processing, topic modeling, um, and then I'm going to show you how I smush it all together into Neo4j and use it to navigate what I've built. Uh, I, like I said, I've given this talk a lot. Sometimes I give it for data scientists, so it's really heavy into like how I do the topic modeling. I'll do it for people that aren't familiar with social network analysis. If you have questions, you can interrupt or you can wait till the end, but I want to cater it to our audience. Um, and I'm going to do some demos at the end. So the problem that we're trying to solve is traditional social network analysis often looks at just relationships between actors, who's talking to whom. It ignores the communications, um, the, the comms data, what they're talking about. Um, so we may know two people have a relationship, but we don't know what's underlying that. Um, and you get a lot of that from the actual message content, whether they're tweeting on Twitter, um, sending each other emails, commenting on the same message board. So traditional um, SNA ignores those two left columns. Um, or right columns, I'm dyslexic. Uh, so if you were to look at sort of like a bunch of emails in your organization, you might get a lot of emails every week from the IT department and um, maybe a lot of emails, a weekly update from the CEO, and you're going to think well, those relationships are very similar, but you're probably going to take a little more time to read the CEO's emails than you are the IT department or maybe vice versa. Um, if I'm trying to target a bad actor's organization, I'm going to care more about one of those than the other, perhaps. Um, so um, with my prototype, which we call it Social B, so I might switch back and forth between that, but with my prototype, Social B, we, we try to solve this problem. Um, the left is traditional network analysis. The right is what we do. So we go through and we use topic modeling to actually turn that unstructured comms data into structured stuff, and we'll enrich the links with that. Um, so Alice and Bob, Alice emails Bob a lot about work stuff and social stuff. Bob emails Kara, they email back and forth about work, but also fraud. So all of a sudden, Bob's relationship is a little bit more interesting to me. Um, and also, you can see the directionality. Bob never replies to Alice, so I don't know what that tells you, but it tells you something. A cool side effect of this technique is we've been able to predict um, relationships that people have just because they behave in a similar fashion. And you can do that, again, with traditional social network analysis. You can say, oh, they all have, like, these two people don't talk, but they have the same friends. Like, so maybe they actually know each other. We can recommend their friends. We do that, but we take it a step further. We say they talk um, or they behave in very similar ways based on the unstructured text that is associated with their relationship. So it's not just friend of a friend, it's 
friend of a friend that talks about, they both talk about Pokemon, so maybe they actually know each other. Um, and then an even cooler side effect that came of that is sometimes they're actually the same person, which is a problem we look at a lot at Novetta called entity resolution, which is my email address, L Drummer at Novetta, is also the same person as my other email address, which I'm not going to tell you guys. But um, So those are both Laura Drummer. Um, and if we can link them up in a chart, then we know a lot more about me. Um, so this, when it works, it can identify hidden relationships. It can also do entity resolution for you. So let's do some basic social network analysis. Um, this is what social network analysis is. So we're looking at um, the way people behave, but we look at them within a community of actors. So you're not just looking at one person sends six emails a week. You're looking at the directionality of who they email. Um, is their behavior distinct within that community or not? Um, and uh, in this example, um, we're talking about people, so social network analysis. You can also just do network analysis, so how, and this can apply to things we do with Neo4j and things this prototype can apply to, but how do different, um, like animals act in a food chain? <laughs> so we often think of who's tweeting at whom, but really think of it as different actors in a network that's interrelated. Um, and one way we've actually applied this outside of just people talking to people is computers engaging with each other. Um, and are they sending similar malware to each other, something like that. So a really easy way to map a network is you create a matrix. Um, if somebody knows each other, maybe we put a one in there. That can just be they know each other or they don't. If we want to actually track how often they communicate, you can put more than just ones in there. You can say they communicate six times, five times. It's all numbers. Um, and that's important because we kind of are going to use math to, we're going to manipulate these numbers a little once we make some topics. And I want you to understand it's, it's all math. Uh, so there's ways to characterize this just by looking at the math. We can count the nodes. There's 15 people in this organization. The edges, there's 25 relationships between these people. You all are familiar with this, I'm sure. And we can do a few other things. We can calculate the network density. So how many possible relationships are there? It's going to be like, 15 times 14 divided by 2, I think. But you figure out what's the max number of like a fully mesh network and what do we actually have? And that gives you an idea of like how much these people communicate. This has a network density of 0.24, so it's not a very interconnected network. We're going to see a picture of it in a second. But the degree, how many neighbors somebody has. So everybody has at least two neighbors. The max person has six. They've got a lot of friends. And the average is a little over three. So. That's all cool, but it's a lot easier if you can visualize it. So this is the same network. Um, there's other ways we've, we've started measuring importance in this network, who's important. Um, the size of the node, if I remember, is the number of degrees. So Gina is pretty important. She has six neighbors. The shading is another kind of um, importance that I measure a lot in networks, and that's the centrality. Um, I think it actually came up in the keynote today, measuring centrality. So how many people have to go through you to get to somebody else? So Emily has four friends. That's a decent amount, since we have an average of 3.3. But if you want to get to anybody on that right side of the network, you have to go through Emily. So she's even more important. Um, in designing this test organization, um, in my head, Emily is like the secretary for all the senior staff. So you don't get to talk to the CEO unless you go through Emily. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that. But. So that's social network analysis. Topic modeling, I've got some sparse slides on this. This is where I have some bonus slides if you want to get into the algorithm I use. Um, so I use um, a concept or an algorithm called NMF, non-negative matrix factorization. It sounds really scary. It's, it's pretty not scary. A non-negative matrix this is a matrix where every value is greater than zero, so, or zero or greater, so there's no negative numbers in it. And we factor it. So we take a matrix and we break it into two matrices. And that has a nice side effect of clustering um, attributes together. So an easier way to explain it is with a picture. I have uh, slides for all of these steps, but I'd rather get to Neo4j, so we'll go there. So here's a matrix. 
Uh, if you all were here for Paul's talk right after lunch, he talked about a document term matrix. This is essentially um, taking every single word that we would see in a collection of documents and making a column for it, and then taking every single document we see in this collection of documents called a corpus, and putting a value as to whether or not that word is in there. So in our example of looking at emails for an organization, all these documents will be emails, all of the columns are going to be words we see. It's going to be something called a sparse matrix, because most words are not going to be in most documents. You're going to have a lot of zeros. Um, and we can already start doing some topic modeling with our eyes. I love this picture, because it kind of helps you visualize what the algorithm is doing. So can you all read the words at the top? We've got bank, money, and finance. So already I can see these, these words are used together a lot. Document two is a lot about, has a lot of that, those words in it. It has the word bank in it a lot more than money, but you know. And these in a matrix would be numbers, right? This would be a higher number. Has nothing about sports club and football, but document one does. And it also has something from over here, show. So document one is probably about like a show with football in it or something. Maybe Sunday night football. Uh, same here, we've got a lot of sports stuff, and there's a little bit from this, this grouping of algorithm of words we've seen over here, this money, football money. So already you can start looking, and if you were an um, algorithm designed to factor this matrix, you can with your eyes sort of see, okay, this is going to be one column, we've got three columns here, I can start seeing the distribution of these topics in this. So that's the really high level version of what I'm doing with NMF, and I'm going to go through my structured text, which is saying who's talking to whom, and I'm going to create a social network analysis or social network map of that. But then I'm going to apply this non-negative matrix factorization to the content of what they're sending to each other, whether it's tweets or computers sending viruses to each other or people sending emails to each other, and I'm going to apply this to it. Then there's this really cool concept called the art model which is not just a topic model, but it's the author-recipient topic model. So now we're not only grouping words, but we're saying who is sending these topics to different people. This is not an original idea that I made up. Um, there's an article published in 2004 by um, Andrew McCallum, I want to say. I always think it's Andrew or Alex. I think it's Andrew. So he did it with a different topic modeler called LDA, which you can read about. It's a Bayesian topic modeler. I prefer NMF for my process. but. Um, if you're the kind of person that can read this, you'll be like, that's not NMF. Um, I'm not trying to trick you. It's just a cool picture. So this is the concept that I'm using to build the Neo4j schema that we're going to get to. All right. So we had our, our network. Now if we were to apply the author-recipient topic model to it, um, I'm going to produce, for the, for the sake of this, I've produced five different topics. Uh, one on the operations of my company, one on the IT department, one on annual performance reviews, the holiday party, and then something that's like people emailing about family stuff. So that first half of this chart is pretty normal. That's topics. If you've done anything with topic modeling, you'll see this is the kind of thing you get. It's like a bunch of words that kind of look related. It's usually messier than this, just truth in advertising. I'm going to show you some of the real results um, for the test data that we ran it on. It's not this clean, but this is just so you can get a sense of what we've built with uh, Neo4j. But then what's special is at the bottom we have the author and recipient. So Joe is the top sender of operations information, and he sends it to Lisa. Um, some interesting stuff to point out if you're trying to figure it out. A lot of people email Gina about the IT department. So she might work there. She might get a lot of help requests. Um, just FYI, like other people work in the IT department, but they prefer to talk to Gina for some reason. Nancy is emailing a lot of people about the annual review, so she's maybe a boss out soliciting information. One of the things Neo4j does, or our algorithm does in Neo4j, is it can do trending over time. So maybe at the start of the assessment period, Nancy's emailing a bunch of people, but then later when everybody's turning in their, their assessment information, maybe they're all emailing Nancy. But at this point in time, she's the top author. And Kate, Lisa, and Mike are the top recipients. And the others are pretty like bi-directional, right? Alice and Carl, and then Carl to Alice. So, 
So the idea behind this was using this art model in Story in Neo4j, we can start identifying subnetworks within a graph. And again, this isn't based on who's connected to whom. It's based on what they're talking about. Um, I drew the lines using normal social network analysis. They sent an email to somebody. But now we're highlighting based on what they're talking about. So we can see these guys all are talking about operation stuff. You know, this might be the organization. Ah. This might be the organization up here, but these are the people that are talking. So if you want maybe the intel or you want to figure out who's really talking about the Whopper this week, like you don't necessarily want to know who's following Burger King, you want to know who's talking about Burger King. And it would be really nice to know who they're talking about it with because then, you know, we're getting some more information. Uh, we talk a little bit about intelligence and law enforcement. Uh, maybe somebody's following ISIS on Twitter, but somebody else is tweeting about how to make IEDs. Like, we kind of want to get both of that. And this mushes it all together in Neo4j. Here's the IT department. Like I said, nobody, Gina, Henry, and Ian, they all work in the IT department. Henry and Ian are like jack offs and they don't like talking to anybody. So everybody emails Gina and she tells them what to do. If you just knew people's names and their organization and you wanted to learn about IT stuff, you might look at these three links here. But in reality, all your data and all the messaging is going to be happening up here. So another one, annual review, poor Lisa is talking to everybody. And then this is an interesting one. So this is the family stuff. Um, so these folks maybe have a friendship outside work or maybe they're in a family, who knows. Um, but there's no link here. They're probably not even talking about each other's families to each other. But we've kind of highlighted some sub networks. If we switch this, again, let's look at, let's switch this to ISIS for a second. Let's say these guys are all talking to each other about building bombs. They might actually talk to each other somewhere separate from where our data is. This is where that hidden relationship comes into play. So we may be missing data. We don't always see everything. So we're kind of inferring from what we know to draw new links between communities. And we'll talk about that too. All right. So we ran our prototype on the Enron email corpus. And we had really great results, but they're huge and ugly, which is why I'm using the baby data set. But I want to show you guys some real results that we had. So most of you are probably familiar with this. Enron, you know, big scandal in 2001. Uh, as part of the Freedom of Information Act, a bunch of their emails were released. And they're a great source if you guys haven't used it before. It's a great source of unstructured data uh, that can be linked. And so we have, it's over like around half a million messages that I've run this on and had some really cool results. So what we do, just a general email. Um, I take the top part, the header, and I use a raw text, so I kind of just wanted to, there's parsers that exist for email, but because this was built as part of Novetta's IRAD funding, it was like, let's have some fun. So um, raw text, we parsed out the header, put, send that to traditional network analysis. I use Network X and Python. I'm kind of jazzed about all the new algorithms that Neo4j has, so I'm going to learn more about that today and see if we can't get a little bit away from Network X. I'll never completely abandon Python because it's my favorite. Um, and then we take the, the message content and we send that to our topic modeler. So this is where Neo4j is really, really helpful and really powerful, I think, for what we want to do with this. I've designed kind of this crazy schema. And some of this you might be looking at and you can say, well, Laura, just, just like make those words attributes of the topics, or make the topics attributes. You know, there's things that's always fun when you're building a new Neo4j schema. What's an attribute and what's a node? The idea behind this is we want all of these to be seeds, like somewhere we can start when we sit down at our big hunk of data. Um, do I want to start with a person and see who they talk to? Do I want to start with a topic and see what the network looks like? Maybe I want to like see what word, because oftentimes topics will have words that overlap. Maybe I just want to start with exploring a word. And then this relationship node um, is pretty fun too. So we'll get into that. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So we have, we maintain directionality. So Alice and Bob know each other. That's actually a line that exists in Neo4j. There's a no. They know each other. So you can do some like really basic queries. But we also start storing information about their relationship. All of these messages feed into these big green nodes. Um, 
there's stuff in there about, you know, Alice emails Bob six times a day, he only writes back once. What does that tell us about the relationship? How reciprocal is this relationship? Um, and then, and again, these are kind of connected, as you can see, but then zooming in. Um, then the relationships all relate to the different topics and a different distribution of topics across their relationship or in different slices of time. And this is where you can start exploring um, how words interact across topics. Do I have any here? Yeah. So meeting is a part of the operations topic and the IT department topic, so cool. Um, so that's kind of what we built in Neo4j, which I'll go to. So again, truth in advertising, if you were to model, this was, I think, 10 executives at Enron, and I modeled all their communications for a week. This is what that network looked like. It's completely pointless. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to a demo where somebody like, does that little graph, and they're like, look at what we can do, and then you go home and run it, and you get the hairball. Like, I wanted to put a real hairball in here for you guys. So you can see, this is reality. But I'm going to show you what our algorithm will do, based, like, takes this hairball and turns it into something. So you can get a, a couple of neat things from this, and I don't think I have it in here. But you can start deriving, like, you know, some of these colors actually relate to communities. This was made in Gephi, so uh, if you're familiar with that. So it, there's, like, actual communities in here you can kind of see. I can't really figure out who's talking to whom, though. If I looked at the, the stats that Network X, you know, spit out for me, it can show some centrality and stuff, but it's not very helpful. But what if I just want to look at one topic? So this was... I believe a topic of people talking about fantasy football in that two week of Enron data. So all of a sudden these people that have like a social life outside work, we've gone, I think it's decreased it by like a tenth, and I don't have the, they weren't pretty slides, but essentially what we've been able to do is focus down on a really small network within that hairball, and this again is, is real, uh, a real screenshot. So we can see those five guys are pretty influential, I think one of them is actually a woman. Um, there's a few of these isolated networks here. They're probably in a different league, you know, they're not cool enough to play with the other people. Um, or maybe, actually, what's actually happening here is this is like the ESPN fantasy football and these guys are on Yahoo or something, so. Because this can't be an entire league, that's giant league crazy. Um, yeah, so does that make sense? Same data set. We've just filtered down using Neo4j by what people are talking about. The other cool thing I talk about is those hidden relationships. So we've got Tori over here, and I forget who this is, Mr. or Mrs. Holt at Hotmail. And our algorithm has said, you know, I really think they know each other. They communicate about topics six, seven, and nine in that order. We don't just say they communicate about these topics, but the distribution of how they speak or how they behave is exactly similar. I think they might know each other. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you they might know each other somehow. Uh, what was cool about having the Enron data is we were able to blind ourselves ourself to about a third of the data. And then we would do this, and we can go back and confirm, like, yeah, they do know each other. I think with um, Tori and this Holt person, that the Hotmail was an alternate email address, and they communicated on another email address. But um, this is not just like guessing. We've actually been able to confirm that it works most of the time. Um, and then if you can see up here at the bottom of the chart, the, um, the Enron data set is Lotus Notes, which is a giant pain in the butt, and it'll mess up email sometimes. H dot dot Foster is actually Chris Foster. They're the same person. So that's that entity resolution I was talking about. I think his middle initial is H. Um, it's, yeah, that's something weird with with the way it parses. So we did some entity resolution there at the bottom, which is nice. All right. So I'm going to go and show you some queries in the actual cipher. There's some of my NMF slides. So this is like on a different screen. Let's see what I do here. OK. Hold on. Am I already in there? Sorry, guys. It's a little hard to drive. Oh, it's because it's on my screen here. Okay. 
So here's that schema. Oh, all right. So this is not going to be pretty. I spent like the last talk making this all in the right spot because I don't know if you guys have ever clicked on a node in Neo4j and it wiggles a lot. Here's Bob and Alice. All right. So I'm not going to expand all of this because it can get crazy. And this is not how you're meant to navigate this data. This is just showing you guys kind of underlying what we're dealing with. And then I'll show you what we do in um, PyDeNeo. Did any of you use PyDeNeo? No? It's cool. If you like Python, it it's, makes it a lot easier to do uh, your Cypher queries and stuff. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that. I'm, I will show you my code, which, you know, nobody ever likes to do that, but um, I'll do that and know that I'm not taking full advantage of Pydenia when you look at my code. I'm mostly just running Cypher queries, but that's fun too. So we have a separate uh, node for Bob's relationship with Alice. The directionality exists and one for Alice's relationship with Bob. Um, and we can see that they both like talk about operations. Um, so does Carl and Dana. One of these, I'm going to regret it, but I'm going to click it anyways. No? Okay. Here it is. So um, what I've put in here to represent, uh, to make this easier, is I've included the top three topics that somebody talks about. On the Enron data set, I think we ran, I generated like 50. So I'm not gonna have, everybody's relationship probably consists of like point, you know, there's like tiny, tiny little bits of topics that may apply and you don't wanna put it in there. So you put in a threshold and that's in our um, actual tool. The user gets to say like, okay, only show me the top five or the top three. If you did show me all of them, it's gonna have some sort of relationship with each topic and that just becomes meaningless. Um, all right. So here's, I don't know. I'm going to move on from this, but let me just show you really quick. We have the topics, the words that all of these topics are related to. So I'm going to pull up my notebook. One more thing I want to point out that isn't represented. I'm going to move this. So one more thing I want to point out that isn't represented in my demo is the um, attributes that actually go into this, uh, that go into this actual tool, not my demo. Uh, so my query is going to be pretty basic, but one of the things we capture when we are putting it into the database is for each person, we've got their name, their org, their gender if we know it. We've calculated their attributes, so their centrality, their betweenness, um, the overall topics for everything they've sent. Um, yeah, that, and then the messages, all we store for those message nodes, which you didn't see in there, but they're tiny blue dots, is the ID, the subject, um, the date time group, the length of the message. Is this like working, guys? Am I freaking out? All right, does that work? Sorry. Um, one thing I didn't point out is the messages themselves, the actual text is stored in a MongoDB, so you don't see, you don't query or access the message content from Neo4j, but you get an ID and that links it to a Mongo query. Uh, but we do have all these things that we can query that can tell us about this relationship, tell us about a message. Um, and then we get, you can get pretty cool with some of the attributes we have on the relationship. Uh, that percent reciprocated, the average message length, so one of the reasons we captured that is like when I you know, meet my boss for the first time or a new client, you know, I'm going to send them a long email about my, generally what I'm going to send to them is like, hey, I'm Laura and I do this and I work on this and I really can't wait to meet you. Uh, when I email my husband, I say like, hey, don't forget to take the dogs out. You know, it's like three words. And that may mean, or if somebody I really hate, you know, I might just be like, okay, got it. You know, I try to be nice to people I dislike, but... 
the length of a message is, is important. It doesn't necessarily tell you it's like a good relationship or a bad one, but it might be more of a casual one versus a formal one. Um, and then, yeah, we track the topics, their frequency over the entire corpus, their frequency as they change over time, so. So I'll pull up the, uh, the Python so you can see it. I promised I'd show it. These are basically just some um, demos, some functions that I've written to, to query this network. But uh, the only part in here that's at all really using PyDaneo is the graph. So it's, I'm connecting to the graph and then I'm sending it some cipher queries. You can do really cool stuff with PyDaneo, especially when you're inserting into a database. It's, it's going to create objects um, based on nodes and then you can like add relationships together. You can draw whole paths. It's really, really neat. If you're at all a Python person, stop writing your own cipher. Don't do what I did. <laughs> make sure I'm still connected. Okay. So now that we have that underlying schema and I'm connecting to that little baby database we just saw before, we can do things like find all the people that are related to a topic. So let's find everybody that's talking about family. And it's just gone in and it's ran a, it's ran a simple query um, to pull those people back. I, um, our prototype is um, I wrote the API for it, and then we have a guy that's much better at visualization than me that's run, written some D3, so that's why mine is very Python-y. Um, so I'm just showing you basically the API, and then I've written some cipher if we want to see a picture. But it already said who those people are. It's going to be Henry and Ian and Alice and Bob, like we already predicted, right? So our network which was 15 people is now down to two. So if we want to figure out who's talking about family stuff, it's going to be that network. This is where it gets a little more fun. Um, I just want to like characterize a relationship between two people. And you can do multiple people, but. Um, so we already know maybe these people interact. Gina and Oscar talk to each other, but now because we've taken the structured text of their messages and we've turned it into these topics and we've stored it in Neo4j, we can actually just say, you selected Gina and Oscar, and they talk about the IT department and annual reviews. So already I kind of have a sense, maybe one of them works in the IT, maybe not. Um, they're worried about their performance reviews, I'm not sure. And I think this query, this is actually what I ran, so if you want to see the cipher that I ran to get this. It's just going to return a list of the topics. So, um, find similar relationships is a really basic version of how we do those hidden ones. So, who has a relationship like Gina? Did I say Gina and Oscar? Yeah. So, Gina and Oscar, can you all see this? They talk about the IT department. Um, the other people that talk like that are Mike and Nancy and Emily and Gina and Lisa and Nancy. And so we're seeing some commonalities here. We're able to start building some communities based on how they behave, not just based on one topic, but you can start filtering down by multiple topics of what they discuss. Um, this one's another easy one. So oftentimes when you're doing, we've separated the, the, not the social network analysis piece, who's talking to whom, that's kind of the basic one -on -one, 101 like building networks. But oftentimes when people are doing topic modeling, they want to explore the topics they've created because that can give you an idea if you're sort of need to adjust those stop words or um, there's some you know, weird outliers that are messing with you. So you can also explore topics in Neo4j. And I've seen some past talks at GraphConnects that just do that. And so I wanted to let you know you can do that as well. Um, so this is going to be. I really shouldn't tell you guys it's going to be like unexciting right before I execute it. But. So the annual review, these are all the words that are in the annual review. Um, I got that by querying the database. I'm not querying anything else. I'm not looking at MongoDB. Um, 
but that's a really good way to start looking at what, what words make up this topic. Um, I only have like the top 10, but this is going to be many, many more. Um, but where it can get fun is comparing topics. So a lot of these are business related, but we have two that are a little bit more fun. We have family and the holiday party. So is there anything that overlaps between those two that would give us an idea of how our topic modeler is working? Is it accurate holiday party? So we've created the database, we've gone back and we've found you know, any word that is connected to either of those two topics and we got banned, um, which maybe is a little misleading, right? Like maybe Alice's son is, plays the tuba and they're trying to figure out what band is going to play at the holiday party. So you can start you know, going back and checking your work. This is a very iterative process, a, a way to like, explore the data that you have. Um, and that is... It in terms of the demos, I have more on how we do NMF. We have a little time for questions. Uh, is that any interest in questions? No? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I can. I can make my repo public. I will work on that. A lot of the, the repo that I showed you before, yeah, is our private Novetta one for our IRAD stuff. So I'll probably change the wiki a bit. And, and the question was, can I make my repo public on GitHub? Go ahead. So why do I prefer NMF over LDA? Uh, that's a really good question. I get that a lot. I've tried both. And based on the data set, one works better than the other. And I couldn't exactly tell you why. So if we were to actually turn this prototype into a, something in production, I think I would allow for an option. Um, NMF is something I've played around with a lot. It makes a lot of sense to me. It's cleaner. But um, yeah, it's a personal preference, which isn't a very scientific answer. But I understand the need for both. Could you go through your NMF bonus slides? Yeah, sure. Um, we have about two minutes. But I will make an effort. Let's see. Just going to start here. Nope. Awesome. So these are the steps you take to apply the topic modeling, the NMF topic modeling to our message data. Um, I'm going to tokenize each document. I'm going to remove all the stop words and the infrequent terms. I'm going to create that document term matrix that we already looked at. I'm going to apply TFIDF, which um, Paul talked about after lunch. And I'm going to factor it. So apply NMF model to matrix means I'm going to factor it. So tokenizing, if you're new to NLP, essentially means finding a way to break up the words into chunks so you can parse them out. Um, so if I took this email, Dear Susan, thank you for your email. I'm going to split it up into a list. I do all of this in um, Python. I use sklearn. Uh, NLTK also can do some of this as well. So the first step is you've got to tokenize it. You've got to get it to a way that it can be separate sentences. One of the things I also do is e remove all the punctuation and lowercase everything. So removing stop words and infrequent terms. So you can see here, I, um, in this email, Martha spelled between wrong. She left an E out of it. So in the entire corpus, I probably don't see between very much. So I'm going to, or between. So I'm going to go ahead and ignore that and not have it affect my topic modeling. And then I'm going to remove those stop words, which are words that you see very commonly. All right. We've seen this already. So after I have all the words that I've cleaned up, I'm going to create a giant matrix. There's going to be a row for every document. So in that Enron, data set we looked at, there's going to be half a million rows. I forget how many columns. I, that would be a cool data point. But a column for every single word that we've seen, most of these are going to be zeros. But when we um, apply the factorization or the factoring to it, we're going to split it up into chunks like you can visually see here. Uh, so TFIDF is awesome. Essentially what it looks at is the term frequency, so how often a word appears in a document. If it appears a lot in a document, it's probably characteristic of what they're talking about. 
Um, and, but words like A and the, those stop words we've talked about, other words in the Enron email corpus, Enron appears a lot, like kind of cool if it's an email from another server, but if it's Enron, you're probably just picking up from the SIG block and stuff. So um, the way it balances out something appearing frequently is if it appears across the entire corpus a lot, that lowers the number. So it's kind of a ratio that balances these two things out. Um, I've tried kind of doing this instead of stop words or doing stop words instead of this and really like it's a nice balance when you do both of them. So, so yeah, this is the last slide for the NMF. So this is how we factor things out. Um, we're going to split it into two and so the first matrix is going to be every single document and a distribution of topics as they exist for that document and every single word is there a distribution across the topics. I'm out of time but I think we have snacks, so if you want to ask questions afterwards or... Um, thank you.